Let's turn today to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, and verse 12. In our last three studies, we were considering the three temptations that came to Jesus Christ at the end of his 40 days fast in the wilderness. And after the temptations were over, we read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, and verse 14, that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. He had gone into the wilderness, filled with the Holy Spirit from the river Jordan, and he had gone through temptation for 40 days, culminating in the three temptations that we have just considered in our last three studies, and returned in the power of the Spirit. And that's very significant. It's not mentioned here in Matthew 4, but we read in Matthew 4.12 that he came into Galilee, but it's mentioned in Luke 4 that he came in the power of the Holy Spirit, which teaches us that temptation does perform a function. We can be filled with the Spirit like Jesus, and yet we need to be tempted for our spiritual muscles to be strengthened. This is one reason why God has not destroyed Satan. He allows Satan to exist so that we can be tempted. And as a result of that, our spiritual muscles are strengthened and we can move in the power of the Spirit. Jesus came forth as a tested person, one who had overcome. It's not enough that we are anointed. We need to be tested. Jesus was anointed. He was also tested. And then he went forth into his ministry. Many would like to move out straight from the anointing. We need the anointing, but we also need to be tested and to be proven in the times of temptation that we are faithful before God can commit to us a ministry. This is the lesson we learn from this section. By this time, John had been taken into custody, Matthew 4.12, John the Baptist, and Jesus withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. We read in Matthew 4.14, this was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And to those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. So we see here, that even the movement of Jesus from Nazareth to Capernaum in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali was the fulfillment of Scripture. We can say, well, that is because it was Jesus Christ. Everything was prophesied concerning him in the Old Testament. But the Word of God reveals very clearly that God has a plan for our lives too. Ephesians 2.10 is very clear when it says that we have been recreated in Christ Jesus so that we might walk in good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, God has made a plan for our lives. And our movement, whether it's from Nazareth to Capernaum or from one town to another or one city to another or one country to another, must be in the will of God. It must be the fulfillment of God's word and God's plan for our lives. Jesus moved in fulfillment of God's plan for his life, even a simple thing like leaving Nazareth, verse 13, and settling in Capernaum was to fulfill the word of God. If only we'd be gripped by this, that God has a plan for our lives exactly like he had a plan for the life of Jesus Christ, we would be more careful in our movements. We can't just go anywhere we like because it's comfortable or convenient for us. It must be in fulfillment of God's plan for our lives. Then, we can fulfill God's purpose for our lives. Otherwise, we may still live a godly life, but we can never fulfill God's purpose and plan for our lives. We can say that a godly life can be lived anywhere on the face of the earth, but God's plan and purpose for our lives can only be fulfilled in that place or those places that God has appointed for us in his plan. And there it's important that we don't seek our own convenience and comfort, but the glory of God and the interests of his kingdom. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John had preached that gospel. And when John was imprisoned, we can say that Jesus took the baton from John's hand and continued this relay race, proclaiming the message of repentance. When Jesus died and rose up and ascended into heaven, in Acts 2.38, we read that Peter 
took the baton and continued the same relay race. And through the centuries, God has always had his men who have proclaimed the same message of repentance. This is the great need of the hour, this message of repentance. And we need to take that baton today from men of God who have preceded us and proclaim the same message. Not that the kingdom of heaven is at hand now, but it has already come. But Jesus' second coming is at hand. Repent. That's the message for the unbelievers and for the church. Turn from sin. Turn from sin is the message that John the Baptist, Jesus and the apostles always preached and that we need to proclaim even today. And walking by the Sea of Galilee, verse 18, he saw two brothers, Simon who was called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. They immediately left the nets and followed him. Notice that Jesus never called a single unemployed person to be one of his apostles. Every case of Jesus calling someone that we read off in the Gospels was of someone who was employed somewhere, whether it was Matthew sitting at the collection of taxes, or Peter and Andrew that we read off here and a little later, James and John, they were working people. Jesus never called any unemployed people to serve him full time. This is the tragedy today. There are many people who have come into full time Christian work who have never been in any secular employment. And one has to seriously question whether they were ever called by God. It's very important that we follow the scriptural principles of find a job be employed, and then if you're faithful in those things that God gives you there, then, if it is God's will, he may call you into the ministry. If we go out into the ministry on other terms, we'll find frustration and fruitlessness and a missing of God's will. But when Jesus called, they left the nets and followed him. The response was immediate, as Jesus expects it to be. People who are slow in responding to any call of God usually end up missing God's plan for their lives. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, being faithful in their task, helping their parents, and he called them. God calls those who are faithful in their earthly task, faithful at home, faithful in their place of work. It's only those who have proved themselves with faithfulness at home and in their secular job who can be entrusted with a spiritual ministry. And they immediately left the boat and their father. Here was something more. They not only left their job, they broke that connection with their father and they followed him. There are two things we need to break a connection with. Our attachment to anything earthly in our job or to our earthly relatives. It didn't mean they didn't care for their father, but when Jesus called, his call took precedence over their other earthly connections. It's very important to bear this principle in mind. And Jesus was going about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. We can say that the ministry of Jesus described here was summed up in teaching, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, evangelism, and healing. Healing always accompanied the ministry of evangelism in Jesus' life and also in the lives of the apostles. Healing was the way by which doors were opened for people to respond to the gospel that Jesus and the apostles preached. And the news about him went out into all Syria. And they brought to him all who were ill, taken with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Through the healing gift that he received through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, doors were opened for him everywhere to proclaim the gospel. But the gospel he proclaimed was not, is not called here the gospel of forgiveness of sins. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. It's very important to notice that. A lot of evangelism today, even connected with the ministry of healing, proclaims merely the gospel of the forgiveness of sins. But here it says that Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, verse 23. Even in the Old Testament, forgiveness of sins was proclaimed. We read in Psalm 32, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute iniquity. And Psalm 103, 
Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgives all your iniquities. He forgives every sin of ours. What then is this gospel of the kingdom? We considered that that was the message John the Baptist preached. The kingdom of God as opposed to the kingdom of self. The kingdom of heaven as opposed to the kingdom of earth. It was the kingdom of heaven. Of a life where our mind is set on heavenly things. Not on earthly things. Where God's interests take precedence over our own personal interests. This is the gospel that Jesus proclaimed. And this is the gospel that we need to proclaim today too. Jesus was not going to be taken up with the multitudes and seek popularity. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. That they had to deny themselves and become disciples. And here is another area where we need to follow the example of Jesus once again and evangelize and proclaim the gospel and engage in evangelism in the same way that Jesus did it in his day.